Which course did you think that biochemistry? Was? Biochemistry, okay. I, 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 I really cannot help you with that one. Okay. Um, everybody has picked up that this is special relativity, physics 3002. Okay, just okay, just checking. All right. I, I, so I have to. I just have to start with an anecdote. When I when I was this was not what I wanted to, to say, but just based on what just happened. Uh, when I was a student um, in my first year at UFA in Amsterdam studying uh, astronomy. I switched to physics later on. Uh, I was studying astronomy and there was this person that I uh, also studied astronomy and after a couple of weeks she said, why are we doing all this maths? I said, well, well what do you think that astronomy was? She said, well, I mean, the, the, the Virgo, uh, the, the Libra, constellations, predicting futures. And I said, no, that's astrology and I don't think you can study that at university. And then she stopped the studies because she really thought that when she went to university and, and, and said astronomy that she would you know be somebody who could do horoscopes later on so she also quit so that's that's sort of the upscaled version of what just happened here okay <laughs> so <laughs> now in that particular case that lady was just completely misinformed i had no idea how you how you enroll in a university course and not know what it is about this i think is just a uh, matter of uh, wrong scheduling so okay um I was just saying that this is the first in a series of courses on relativity. And if you want to become a theoretical physicist or a particle physicist, or even, it doesn't matter really what kind of physicist, relativity is an extremely important topic. Yes, um, you might have heard it before as some sort of this fringe topic that sometimes maybe when things go very fast and all of a sudden the rules of time and space change, which is not untrue, but it applies to every single th thing, even non-exotic things, everyday life things, also obey the rules of relativity. There are some effects that you already know of that you probably didn't know are just relativity effects. So if you had this conception that relativity maybe is a course or a topic in physics that only apply to very exotic things, then you are somewhat mistaken. I can name three, four things that are just everyday things and are just Relativity, even if you didn't know about it yet. I will already give away why that is, and that is because relativity is a theory about space and time. It's not a theory about energy, it's not a theory about mass, it's not a theory about light. Sometimes when you see relativity being taught, they really focus on that it has something to do with light. Light has a special property, and as a result of that, relativity comes out. This is wrong. Relativity is a property of space and time. Now, that immediately means that everything that exists in space and time, and I dare you to name your thing that does not, or at least the things that we study in physics, um, everything that exists in space and time does have to follow the rules of relativity. So really it is a very important topic and I think it's good for everybody who has some interest in physics to have studied it at least once. Now again, if you want to do more relativity later on than in period four, we have relativistic electrodynamics, period five is general relativity, and uh, you're very welcome to follow those courses. For the people who are just follow, going to follow this one, very welcome. And the other people, very welcome. So, um, let's start with some logistics before we start the uh, course proper. Um, we're going to use this book here. I'm not sure if you have it or have a PDF or you have seen it. This is the book that we're going to use. The book is good and it is great. Uh, we're going to use it certainly the first two weeks or so, but later on we're going to sort of diverge from the book. That is because the book follows a particular style of explaining relativity, which is correct if you only want to know this small part of relativity. But if you want to be, to, to be trained in a way that you can also apply to other fields of physics, again, uh, electrodynamics, period four, general relativity, then at some point the book doesn't really follow the course that you should uh, uh, follow. Now, I'm going to be very clear about that, so you don't have to worry that if you're going to study this book that, you, that you're going to learn wrong things. Everything is correct. It's just that the particular style at some point is going to diverge in a certain way. Yes. Now, we are going to book for, uh, use the book for um, the exercises. The exercises are very good. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Now, most of the material, of course, will also come uh, via here. And I do this in a very particular fashion. Um, I record these lectures, always, and I will have them uploaded by tonight. Now, that does not mean 
that you can just stay in your bed all day. Well, I mean, you're welcome to. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's no rule that says that you really have to be here. But the reason that I do this, this recording, is because I want people who are here to focus on the interaction. If you're just going to see how I do things, then it's very good, but you will not learn a lot of relativity yourself. The best thing that you can then do is memorize what I have done and hope that I will going to ask the same thing on the exam. Relativity is really a, a course, a topic in physics that only gets into your mind by frequent participation and frequent thinking and frequent practice. I always compare it to doing yoga or so. Okay? Um, if you want to become a yoga master, trust me, I am not one of them, but if you want to become a yoga master, you do not learn yoga by watching somebody else do it, even if you do it a lot. Okay? You learn something. Oh, well, you should first put your hand here and then your, then your leg goes behind your, behind your neck or so. Fine. You know what the steps are, but you're not able to do it. So why do I record these lectures? It's because I want you to already start doing it as we are sitting here, instead of being too focused on writing down everything that I'm doing. So I'm recording these things so you can focus on the interaction, on the style. What is it that we are doing and why? And all those little mathematical details you can pick up at home when I've uploaded these things. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, that also means um, you might be on YouTube. Don't worry about that, because everybody's faces are obscured, except for Felix's screen here. <laughs> but I will say that this microphone is extremely sensitive. Okay. If you're going to gossip, <laughs> feel free to. You might make some enemies, okay? Because everybody in the world is going to look at these videos. They're not going to see any faces, but they might hear something. You saw that guy? You saw what he was wearing today? Shh, it's too bad. So yeah. just keep that in mind. <laughs> you already said somebody in mind? Or? No, the, the poor biochem guy from earlier. Oh. <laughs> I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, no, and it's more than that because he actually walked in front of the camera. So I might have to put a little little black, black bar in front of his eyes and make him, uh, or pixelate him or something like that. Yeah, so. No, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll find some way to make sure that he, is, uh, he becomes anonymous. Okay, so that is, uh, that is the plan. Um, here's the good news. Relativity is, mathematically speaking, uh, not very difficult. Yay. You can, yay. <laughs> you can actually get by in uh, relativity if uh, you only know high school mathematics. That is not completely true. Of course, I can think of exercises where you're going to need more. But the heart of relativity is just high school mathematics. So this is not where the difficulty will lie. The difficulty, yes, there are difficulties, is in concepts. I already said it's a theory of space and time. So that means you have to relearn what you thought you knew about space and time. And that is a very hard sell sometimes. Even if you're completely willing to understand that space and time do not work the way that you thought in the last 20 years or so, um, even if you're completely willing to do so, you will find in practice that it is hard. Your mind really has to relearn a couple of things. So do not get disparaged at the moment that you find that some of these things do not immediately fall into place. This is why, again, I want this interaction. Yes? This is why it's so important to practice. This is why it is compar comparative to yoga. You have to do it and do it and do it and do it. And at some point, you become more agile in yoga or more understanding of space and time and relativity. So again, this is of this uh, video. Now, everything that you just said about this being mathematically somewhat easy is true for special relativity. Now, there's also this bigger theory, again, period five, general relativity, which we're going to explain that in a moment, but which is this follow-up step to special relativity, extra rules of space and time. Those are also difficult conceptually, and they're difficult mathematically, okay? So that is going to be somewhat of a hard sell. Now, again, this is why I very much like this book, but only to a point, because the book teaches you these things only if you're only going to do special relativity. If you want to do general relativity, then this book will teach you some tricks, but the tricks do not apply over there. So at some point I will diverge, but again, I will be very clear about when that happens. For the people who cannot wait, there's this little booklet. It's by this guy who... Well, I sort of know something about relativity. His name is Albert Einstein. He wrote this book. Uh, it's a book. It's, it's literally called The Meaning of Relativity. They wrote when he was still alive. He died in 1955. 
And if you really want to know relativity from the master himself, then this might be a book for you. And he knows exactly what to say and what not to say to make sure that everything will fall into place. I do have to say, if you're going to study this book at some point, you might want to do it after you've done a couple of courses, because he is sort of brief in these things. The good news about this is, this is freely available. Right? You can just download it. I will actually post a PDF on Elaeum, so you can study that for yourself if you want. And all of this being said, let's get started. Now, I always like at the beginning of a lecture series to just start with a small discussion. I would like to know where you guys are with your understanding or your, what you think is your understanding of the topic at hand, in this case, relativity. So, my idea is... Just write down a couple of things that come to mind when you think of relativity. It doesn't have to be correct, doesn't have to be incorrect, just whatever comes to mind. And after we have 10 or so of these little bullet points, then I'm going to string everything together and that will give us our course schedule for the next seven weeks. So you know exactly in what week we're going to do what. So, let's call this, let's think of a nice word here. Bullet points about relativity, how's that? And I invite you to give me anything that you've heard about relativity, wrong or right, even if you don't exactly know how to place things, feel free. Speed of light is constant and invariant. Oh, <laughs> okay. Alisa actually made two statements. She said something about constancy and about the invariance, and if you don't know what the difference is, don't worry, this is what the course is for. Speed of light. It's constant, and, well, there's a second statement, speed of light is invariant. I'm not going to comment at this point on what all these things mean, I'm just collecting thoughts. Anybody else? So it's all based on the observer's perspective. All right. So uh, it's based on who measures what. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's, it's, it's relative. Yeah. Yes, you know, no, no, it, this is not an anti statement. Relativity is about b things being relative. The numbers are not the same for one observer as they are for the next. Okay, so even though it's going to sound like I'm putting your leg, relativity, the theory, <laughs> is relative. <laughs> is about relative statements. Actually, the theory itself is not relative. The theory itself holds for everybody. Yes. But the numbers that come out are different for people. Anything else? Inertial reference frames. Inertial reference frames. Yeah, no, it's correct. It's just <laughs> that uh, I wasn't expecting that one. Uh -huh. You already some background in relativity? Mm, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> A few. Okay. Inertial reference frames, sure. I'm sure you've heard more about Einstein, about relativity. Maybe some formula. Lorentz contractions. Well, Lorentz contractions. All right. Lorentz contractions. So what do those mean? What is that statement? Uh, oh, OK. Um, well, that time and distance change depending on your, or well, observe time and distance change depending on your speed. All right. But then I'm going to rephrase a little. We're talking about mm -hmm. Lorentz transformations. Yes. Yes, and the Lorentz contraction is a mm -hmm. one particular example mm -hmm. of a bigger set, which are called the Lorentz transformations. Yes. In fact, let me already write down that this basically splits up in two varieties, namely this other thing called Lorentz. Uh, these are the Lorentz contractions, and there is this other thing called Just time dilation. There's some more, but we'll get there. Like at, at high speeds, the, the momentum has this factor in front, which is the Lorentz factor, or something like that? I hear a Lorentz factor. Basically, everything has the Lorentz factor in front of it, so also distance and time. And sometimes, even though not really mass, but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. The nice thing about Felix is that, um, remember that I said that typically you start with special relativity and you build up to general relativity? He did the, he's going the other route, right? He did general relativity last year. 
and he's now doing special relativity. Even Einstein did it, did, did it the other way around. Um, but he, he of course, is right. Uh, I wrote down mechanics because he mentioned the word momentum. Yeah. Relativity will teach you something about how fast things are moving, under what conditions, and these sorts of things. Um, I myself mentioned one, uh, space and time, right? That is a theory about space and time itself. So there is something space-time dynamics about this. They're all encapsulated here, but I would like to make it a separate entry. Is that about it? Is there a formula that maybe that you know? There's this one formula that's um, quite known in physics, even outside of physics. E equals mc squared. E squared, of course, yes. Plus b squared plus c squared. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there is a <laughs> different version of the same formula, e squared is p squared c squared plus m squared c to 4, where, speed, where c is the speed of light. All right. And then 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Mm -hmm. That is your Lorentz factor. <coughs> no, we, we, we don't really have to do this course anyway, right? You already know <laughs> all the equations. <laughs> Last chance. Everybody all good? All right. So, out of interest, who has seen any form of relativity before? Quantitatively, I think you sat down and did an exercise. Some, two, three, four, five people, okay. Um, the other people. Relativity is, well, no, let me rephrase. It, 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 it's a course that you picked. Is that because of interest in later physics, or is there inherent interest? I would like to know how space and time operate. What's the only the only thing left on the course <laughs> schedule? <laughs> no, I'm asking. I'm sort of looking that direction because there were some people who had already done relativity. We're sitting here, and um, because it might be then that most of these things do not have a direct meaning for you. Yes. So I'm going to connect these things to each other. So what I'm going to say now is sort of what is relativity about? I'm going to skip all the quantitative stuff, but what it is it about? And in what way are we, are we going to study it in the next couple of weeks? So this is going to be freestyle talking. So um, relativity, again, is a theory of space and time. I wrote it down like one word, space time, because you will see that you cannot have a theory of time without having a theory of space. They're intertwined. You cannot make that make it any different. It's a theory of space and time. Einstein found out that space and time itself are dynamic. This is completely non-trivial. If I'm going to take, well, Dion, I just happen to be looking at you, okay? So there's a couple of meters between him and me. That amount of space can be made bigger and smaller. Of course, I can do it, yes? I can make it our distance a little bit smaller just by stepping into his direction or stepping away from him, and he can do the same, of course. But that's us doing it. That's our muscles doing it. That's something else than space-time doing it. What Einstein found out is that space-time itself, space and time separately and combined, can become larger and smaller. That is a strange concept. That means that the two meters that he and I have in, uh, between us can be made bigger, not because he's doing something or because I'm doing something or because matter is doing something. No, because the distance, the existence of meters itself can be made bigger and smaller. Space itself is dynamical. One meter is not a fixed number. In very much the same way, the amount of time is not a fixed number. Five <coughs> seconds to one person is not the same as five seconds to the next person. Now, to be sure, I'm not talking about you standing in the rain waiting for the bus and you want to get in the hole because it's 2 in the morning, right? Then you feel that the 10 minutes that the bus will take before it comes feels like an hour. Maybe this lecture is one <laughs> example as well. <laughs> or the other way around, that you're doing something very fun and flies by in two minutes or so. That's, of course, all psychological, yes? I'm talking about literally time itself. Again, not psycho uh, psychology. I'm not talking about the machines with which you measure time that those have some weird effect that sometimes it gives you a bigger or smaller number. No, time itself can be made bigger and smaller, just like the amount of meters can be made bigger and smaller because space itself does it. Time has this, uh, this same effect. So that is very different from um, maybe what you have thought for the last 20 plus years or so, that you think, well, one meter is just one meter, right? Regardless of, of who measures it. And if something takes one hour, then it will take one hour for everybody who is doing the measuring. In other words, time and space, pre-Einstein, were conceived as absolute. It might be difficult to measure those numbers, 
you might be psychologically thinking that the numbers are different, but if you would do the measurement and you do them correctly, everybody will, say, will find the same number for the amount of uh, space and the amount of time. This is not true anymore. This is what relativity will tell you. Space, time is dynamical. Now, that has all kinds of consequences. Einstein found out quantitatively what the formulas are, are with which you can calculate how many meters there are and how many seconds there are. Those are these Lorentz transforms. Yes? So the Lorentz transforms are really just the, the mathematical statements of exactly that space-time idea that it is dynamical. In the Lorentz transforms, you will find this thing called the Lorentz factor. It will arise naturally in the second half of this lecture today. There is this particular mathematical function that tells you how much space will become shorter or will become bigger, and how much time will become smaller or bigger. That you go from 3 seconds to 5 seconds, or you go from 3 meters to 5 meters. That is done by these equations, but this one, the Lorentz factor, is <coughs> the key thing that you have to calculate. So this is how we get here. Now, how did Einstein get there? How did Einstein come to this very strange idea? Um, it depends a little bit on who you ask. If you read your typical history books, they will tell you because nature or physicist had found that the speed of light is invariant and constant. Those are two statements. It means that if you would measure how fast light goes, and the number is 300,000 kilometers per second, that everybody who will measure that number will find the same number. But here's a strange thing. If I were to have a flash of light here, right, a, sh a shine of flashlight, and by the way, just to give you some, inter so, some interpretation to how fast that is, the speed of light, if, if that light had the opportunity to move around the Earth, unobstructed by walls or whatever, I would press this button, 300,000 kilometers per second, the circumference of the Earth is 40,000 kilometers. So that means if I would press this, uh, uh, this, 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 this uh, laser pointer, say, that flash of light in one second will already have gone around the Earth, so past me, seven times in that first second. The speed of light is ridiculously high. Now, what people found at the beginning of the 20th century was that it is an invariant. By invariant, it is meant that if I'm going to measure how fast it light, this light goes, Right? What I just have to do is measure how many meters it travels in how many seconds, divide those two numbers, and I get how fast it goes, right? Car goes 50 kilometers an hour. You measure how fast or how many meters it has tra uh, traveled in, in one hour, 50 kilometers. And then you know its velocity, 50 uh, kilometers per hour. But everybody pre-Einstein would have thought, well, if that car is driving along this road with 50 kilometers an hour, and I uh, pursue it with my own 20 kilometers per hour, then our relative velocity would be 30 kilometers per hour, right? It's his 50 kilometers per hour, but compared to me, he doesn't traverse 50 kilometers in every hour because I'm chasing him, so it would be 30 kilometers per hour. Experiment and theory at the beginning of the 20th century told us that that is not true. If you would have this car, it goes 50 kilometers per hour, and you would measure it by standing still, you would say it goes 50 kilometers per hour. And you would ask another guy who is himself in a car pursuing that car with his own 20 kilometers per hour. Again, you would think that he would see that first car go with 30 kilometers per hour. No. Still goes for 50 kilometers per hour. That is strange, isn't it? If that were the case for cars. That it doesn't matter how fast you are pursuing the thing, it will always go with respect to you with 50 kilometers per hour. Now, for cars, that is indeed not the case. But for light, it is. It doesn't matter how fast you are chasing the light, it will always move away from you with 300,000 kilometers per hour. That statement is what we call invariance. That's this statement. That no matter how fast you yourself are moving, light will always have the same velocity. Now, Alice also said constant. constant. Constant is a different statement. Constant means that if you would measure it now and measure it a couple of seconds later, right, you do two speed measurements of light, then both of those numbers are the same, that the number does not change. You see the difference? One of them is the number does not change from one measurement to the next. That's constant. Invariant means 
doesn't matter how fast yourself you are moving, it will always go with the same number. Two statements. This is the important one for our theory. I will tell you in a moment what experiments told us this, but the fact, oh, I'm sorry, I am so sorry. This is the one, there we go. Also important, but not for relativity. Uh, invariance, because that means if the speed of light has to come out with the same number for everybody who measures it, and speed, as you know, is the amount of distance divided by the amount of time, but the distance is different from one observer to the next. Again, let's take the car example. Standing here, measuring how fast, how many meters the car has moved. 50 kilometers in one hour. But if I move along with it and I see that it still has traveled 50 kilometers per hour, then that means the amount of time measured between the two people must have been a different number. Do you see the reasoning? If this number, the speed of the car, Let's drop the car, light. If the speed of light, the V, has to come out the same, even if you're traveling the car, even if, with respect to you, this number is different, then the only way that it can happen that this number comes out the same if this number is different from one observer to the next, if this number has adapted. That is time dilation. That is this effect. That the amount of seconds for one observer and the next is different. So, going back to our list, the speed of light is uh, invariant, is directly responsible for these space-time effects. Yeah. We're going to unpack this, of course, in the next couple of weeks. It also tells you that relativity is relative. Amount of seconds is not the same for everybody. Amount of meters is not the same for everybody. Same holds for other numbers. Electric field is not the same for everybody. Energy is not the same for everybody. In fact, you will find in physics that very few numbers are the same for all observers. Speed of light is an example, of course. But many numbers are not the same. Let me give you an example. Do you know what the formula is for kinetic energy, say, from your classical mechanics? From your high school? Somebody fill me in. Half mp squared. Half mp squared. And v is the velocity with which the thing that you're looking at is moving, yes? So I'm going to take you as an example. There we go. Now, I am going to measure her kinetic energy using this formula. What is the number that comes out? Zero. I would say zero because she and I are not moving. I'm not seeing her move, right? Mm -hmm. But now I start moving and I now I'm going to look at her. Then all of a sudden, she, as seen by me, is moving away in that direction with a, with a number V. Agreed? So that means all of a sudden, for me moving, that number for kinetic energy is a different number now. So apparently, if you go from moving with respect to her and not moving, numbers change. This is one example. Relativity tells you that almost all numbers change. That's the relative part. Everything in relativity is relative except for a few numbers. Speed of light is one. If she was a light beam and I would have measured her velocity, then, and that's that statement again, that number would have come out the same. Yes? But that's why in classical mechanics they assume that we're in a Inertial, frame. inertial frames. I'm so happy, yes. Mm -hmm. Inertial frames. <coughs> I, I, I just have to ask, what is an inertial frame? I was not expecting this to come up on the board, by the way, but I'm happy. So what is an inertial frame? It's a non-moving, uh, or it's a frame that moves at con constant speed, or no speed at all. It's not accelerating. With respect to what? <laughs> to the object you measure. Sure. Uh, the object is in the frame. Hmm? The object is inside the frame. Yeah. The one that you measure. Oh, yeah. But, so, the, yeah, the frame doesn't move. Oh, what? The frame doesn't accelerate. I mean, the two frames yeah. relative to each other. No, we talk about one frame. If I give you a frame and I ask you, is that an inertia frame? How do you know? Yeah, acceleration. Well, with respect to what? Observer. But if 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 no, I am observer, observer I I am always at rest in my own frame. Agreed. So I'm never moving with respect to my frame. But the observer doesn't. Uh, the observer accelerate if uh, if the observer doesn't accelerate towards the observed things. Then then it's an inertial frame? Then it's not an inertial frame. If it accelerates, then it does it's not an inertial frame. If yes. it's constant speed, then it's an inertial frame. It's correct but it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's a no, I mean I'm, I mean this is why I was not expecting to come on the board because it's a highly, highly difficult topic, inertial frames. Now I'm going to mention something about that and for the people who are not picking up on this, don't worry because it's not part of this particular course per se. But it is important because it was brought up, yes? 
The, the question is, if you have a coordinate system, right? So imagine that attached to me there is an x-axis and I'm happy to be in the middle. So my position in this coordinate system is x is zero. Even if I'm moving because this frame moves along with me. I'm always at the zero point, yes? But I'm going to take you again. If you also attach to your ballot button have an x corner system, you will be at zero always in your frame. But if I am moving with respect to you in your x axis mm -hmm. that, that's all laid out here, that number changes, yes? Mm -hmm. Changes, changes, becomes bigger, 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 etc. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm still in mine. Now, nature, so everybody can think of his own or her own corner system. Just attach it to your belly button, have an x-axis stick out, a y-axis may or a y-axis, maybe a z-axis or something like that. Nature has two different corner systems. My corner system obeys particular rules. And there's also corner systems, maybe that will be your belly button. <laughs> I'm sorry, just going to take you as an example. But your corner system might not obey the same rules as me. There's two types of corner systems. One of them is called inertial frames, and one of them are called non-inertial frames. And that difference is very important in general relativity. This is why I'm not going to delve it out a little bit more here. Now, very briefly, and again, if you're not picking up on this, don't worry about it. Very briefly put, an inertial system is a coordinate system in which Newton's laws hold. Mm -hmm. That is not trivial. Name your Newton law. There's three of them. Maybe you have your favorite. Sure. Does this hold in all corner systems? Well, I sort of already gave it away, right? No. The answer is no. <coughs> I can give that in an immediate example. Suppose that I have a corner system here. Here's x. One, two, three. So this is an x-axis. Zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. OK? That's somebody's corner system. Make it mine. But I'm also going to define another coordinate system, somebody else's. In fact, let it be hers again. Suppose that I have a mass here. Well, it's not, it's not making it in the middle. It doesn't matter for my example, but just we'll put it here. At the position m is 2, a mass. There's no force acting on the mass, right? That's a given. Will this mass move? It's possible. Yeah, sure. It, Newton's first law says it might have gone with the constant velocity. But let's make the situation such that this mass is at rest with respect to this black coordinate system. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know that there's no mass, that there's no uh, forces acting on it. That's mm -hmm. a given that I give you as, an, as my uh, situation. Then this law uh, is correct. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Because no forces. F is zero tells you, well, the, the acceleration must be zero, which is true because it's not accelerating in the black frame. But now we take the green frame. Mm -hmm. And the green frame happens to be moving in that direction in accelerated fashion. It will go faster and faster with respect to the black frame. And the person in the green frame will also look at the same mass. Can you see that in the green frame, this mass started at 2, but a second later it's at 1, and a second later it's at minus 1 or so accelerating, right? So the distance becomes bigger. So if the person in the green coordinate system would have used this law, he would have said, hey, there's no force, but I do see an acceleration. Newton's second law does not hold in both of these frames. There's one frame in which it does, the black frame in my example. It does not hold in the green frame. Yes? There's nothing you can do about this. Newton's laws do not hold in all corner systems. So physicists, in, in fact, Newton himself realized this already. He said, well, that means that nature has two different types of <coughs> corner systems. One of which my rules hold, and one of which they don't. The ones in which they hold are just by definition called inertial frames. The ones in which they don't are, the green frames here, are called non-inertial frames. Now, I'm going to leave it at that at this, at this point. I only bring it up because it was brought up as a series uh, on the board. But I want you to really memorize this. No matter if you're never going to do physics anymore, Newton's laws only hold in very select frames, and in the other ones, they don't. Yes? But if you, like, if you look at the green perspective, 
Yes. And the m is moving, is accelerating in this direction. Yes. But then that becomes a non-inertial reference frame, right? The black one? Because that is accelerating without force being applied. To it. No, wait, the statement is not if a system accelerates, therefore it's a non-inertial frame. That is not ah, the statement. Okay. The statement is if I give you a coordinate system and I want to know whether it's an inertial frame or not, you have to check Newton's laws. If they don't hold, you conclude not inertial frame. For, for the green frame, Newton's laws don't hold, looking at the black frame. Uh, looking at the mass. Looking at the mass in the black Yes, frame, yeah. because if I would have removed the black frame altogether... The mass would be accelerating towards the left yes. without a force being applied to it. Yes, so that means the person in the green frame can immediately say, even without looking at a black frame, would just look at the mass and say, wait a minute, something is wrong here. Newton's laws do not hold. Okay. So that also means that there is sort of a check whether you are an inertia frame, just check Newton's laws. Now for the people going to do general relativity, it's not as simple as that. It's actually quite complicated. But I'm going to leave that for the first lecture in that series in period five. Now, it was broader here because it had, does have something with special relativity. Namely, and this is how we're going to connect this last piece here. Namely, If Newton's laws do not hold in all coordinate systems, they held in the black one but not in the green one, you can ask the same thing about relativity. Does relativity hold in all coordinate systems? Does it hold in the black one? If so, does it also hold in the green one? You do not know the answer at this point, so I'm just going to tell you. Newton's law, excuse me, special relativity, the theory that we're going to do in this next six, seven weeks, only holds in inertial frames. In fact, I find that so important, I'm going to make a big statement. Special relativity only holds in inertial frames. Super important. Why? Um, I have a short answer and a, and, and a long answer. The long answer is, is period five. <laughs> the short answer is um, because it was made up out of, it, you start with the inertia frame, so therefore, so this is how we're going to build up the theory, and therefore all the conclusions only hold in, in inertia frames. Yes? So actually the definition of an inertial frame is a frame that accepts only Newton's law and <laughs> special relativity. Yes, but you have to be careful because People in mathematics would say, wait a minute, so that's two conditions. Ah. If it holds, it has to hold, and uh, it, has and, to, yeah. it has to hold, it has to obey Newton's laws and special relativity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The statement is not as stringent. If it holds Newton's laws, then automatically it will hold special relativity. Okay. 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 So, now the reason that this is so important to write down, if, you, if you're never going to do anything with physics, is because there's also a different theory of relativity. I've already mentioned it a couple of times, general relativity. The difference between general relativity and special relativity is exactly this. Special relativity holds in inertial frames. General relativity holds in all frames, including non-inertial ones. This is why it's called special. It only holds in special cases, inertial frames. Here's the good news. In this course, we're only going to look at inertial frames. At the moment that you step away from inertial frames, you go to these green systems, then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Mathematically, it's solved, okay? Don't worry about it. We know how to do it. But then things become much more complicated. So just so you know, special relativity, it holds in inertial frames. And I think that's, uh, that completes our list, doesn't it? Well, we still have mechanics. mechanics. Yeah, mechanics is, is how, how can you make things move in the first place? Newton's laws will tell you how. How do you make things move, accelerate? Well, just push against them. That's what Newton's second law tells you. But acceleration is distance, sloppily saying, is distance divided by the square of uh, the amount of time that it takes, right? How, how many seconds it takes to make something go faster. But how many seconds is different from one system to the other, from one observer to the other. So that means this law can certainly not fully hold in special relativity. It has to be updated by a different law. That's this one. All right, so. I think we've covered now all of them.
Now let's make a list of how we're going to tackle all these things in the next couple of weeks. And then we have a break and then we're going to start proper with deriving things. Yeah? So we are now in week one. And this week we're going to do an introduction. That's these sorts of stuff that you sort of see how things are connected so you know what we're going to do. And secondly, we're going to derive this idea that space meters can become longer and shorter, Lorentz contraction, and we're going to also derive this time dilation, that the amount of seconds can also be longer and shorter. So at the end of today, you will actually have already gotten your first formula in relativity, so that's good. That's week, week one. Week two, we're going to do the, same, the exact same thing. But now we're going to do it right. Here I'm going to derive this after the break in the way that you typically find it in the books. This is this, for instance, this book that does it in this way, which is fine if this is, is the only thing that you want to know. If you want to continue in relativity, then this particular style is not the best way of doing it. So next week I'm going to derive it again in a completely new way. But this way will tell you how you can apply to everything else and not just this particular course. So, I'm going to write down the words. If you don't understand them yet, probably don't worry about it. I have a question. Yes, please. Why would we derive it in a manner that's not applicable for the rest of physics? That is a very good question. Why would we do it in the first place in this way? Two reasons. First of all, uh, because it's, it's didactically more easy. You understand it much easier. This is a much more abstract way. So it's sort of a stepping stone. Once you have seen that, yes, this is what comes out, then it's easier for me to explain how you can do it in a more mathematical way. Mm. The other reason, it's a very good question. Why would we do this in the first place? The other reason is that most of the books that try to teach you relativity do it in this way. And I want you to be able to pick up a book and see it done in that way and recognize it. So this is just to make sure that you connect with other books as well. It's the first one, the like light clock thing, where you trigonometry yes. your way through, and then the second one is Minkowski tensor. Yes. Again, here's somebody with prior knowledge. Yes. He's done the general relativity course again. Um, also, what we're going to do here is derive the full Lorentz transforms. You might remember from our discussion just a second ago is that the Lorentz transforms are all the relationships between space and time. And we're going to fully derive them just from mathematics alone. Then there's week three. In week three, we are going to, by that time we'll have all the formulas. But as you know from, I guess, from all kinds of physics, sometimes things become easier if you can look at them in graphs. Right? It's much easier to look how things go if you see a visual representation than just if I give you the formula. So, in that week, we're going to take all of our mathematically derived results and we're going to put them in a graphical style. And they, these are called Minkowski space-time diagrams. And as a result, we will be able to solve some famous paradoxes. We will see as we go along that sometimes the result looks so strange and counterintuitive that it feels that something must be wrong with the theory. And in that week we're going to show you that nothing is wrong with the theory. And it's much easier to do this using graphical means than it is by using formulas. Now in week four we will have our midterm. But content-wise, when we go to week five, we're going to start with mechanics. All of this, up until this point, is only about something is already moving and you're looking at things. How much distance does it travel? How many seconds does it take? You're not touching the thing that's moving, you're just looking at it. But of course, if you want to interact with nature, you have to touch stuff. Either with your hands, you have to push it, you have to put it in a machine, you have to squeeze light on it or something, like that. you have to do something with the stuff. So in week five, we're going to study relativistic mechanics. So that's like Newton's laws, but also applicable in special relativity. I left one open here, and that is because if you want to derive relativity 
mechanics. The best way to do it is by this new mathematical formalism. It's called Lagrangian formalism. I hear some sighs and moans. <laughs> Why is that? Super difficult. Sorry? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. Have you seen this already? In classical mechanics. In, yeah, but in classical mechanics, the Ronald Vesta, I think, <laughs> takes one week. Yes? Yeah. He, he skipped he it. Skipped it. He skipped and it. he also skipped it. Okay, then things are, <laughs> then things are very difficult, okay? It's not even like you're exactly taking longer, Gideon, <laughs> to do it. What's that? <laughs> it's not like you're taking longer to do it. No. You're taking half a week. No. Yes, but it's in relative time, right? So I can make it longer if I want. <laughs> just move very fast you and go make faster, it longer. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll understand more if you we go just go to an non-inertial <laughs> frame, which the amount of seconds for this week is, is longer. Now, uh, uh, experience tells me that, 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 this, that this can be done quite nicely. Now, um, if you want to do mechanics, so if you want to update Newton's laws and make them applicable in special relativity, then uh, you can either take Newton's laws and make try to squeeze relativity in, and that works. But there is a much better way of doing it, and this again is just Lagrangian mechanics. Now, Lagrangian mechanics is just an other mathematical way of writing Newton's laws. But this new mathematical way makes it much easier to incorporate relativity. So in the physics team, we decided that we're going to do Lagrangian formalism in this particular course. Especially if later on you are going to go into physics, then you must have seen relativity or Lagrangian physics in more places than just uh, one week in one course, 1.5. Okay, so I'm going to teach you how that works, and then we're going to apply it immediately to mechanics. Now, this part will be about, yes, you're allowed to touch things, right? You make, ma make things move but only if you make the move with constant velocity, the object itself. But of course, in real life, things hardly ever move with constant velocity, yes? Yeah, the speed of light, sure. But other things, me walking up and down, you throwing stuff, things typically accelerate. So we're going to do the same. We're going to do, so this mechanics, no acceleration. And we're going to do the same here with mechanics with acceleration. What if you're allowed to make things go faster and then look at them? How does that work? Then there's one final thing left. If we have all of this written down, we will prove the conservation of energy. <coughs> now, I'm sure everybody knows the conservation of energy because it, it appears in chemistry and in physics and in biology and everywhere. They even have a textbook at home that says, the conservation of energy cannot be proven, but physicists have measured it so many times they're convinced it is true. That's a wrong statement. You can prove this mathematically. After we've done all of this, we can prove rigorously that energy must exist and that it is conserved. So we will have that proof. The proof that energy, that some number exists, that whatever you do with nature, conservation, that whatever you do to nature, you will always have the same amount of energy. Again, something that you already knew from your high school days and from your other courses, but we're going to rigorously prove it using relativity. By that time, I think we have a full understanding of things. All clear? So, I propose we have a break. And then we're going to move all through this in this scheme. And we're going to start with deriving space and time rules, Lorentz contraction, time dilation. Any questions so far? No, no, no? Good, because that means it's time for me to get some cafe. We don't have a clock here. We don't have a clock. It is 12.07. 13 or 7, no, 12. No, 12. 12. Thank you. Yeah. You're keeping my stuff. Mm. Forgive me, for I have a cookie in my mouth. Mm. Mm. Coffee. Okay, people, let's get started. Now, after this long introduction, I hope you have some feel of what we're going to do. Let's start and do it. First of all, we're going to build up this week everything from this idea that the speed of light is invariant. And again, invariant means no matter who measures it, no matter who measures how fast a particular ray of light is going, no matter how, if that person himself is chasing the ray of light, everybody who does the measurement will find 
the same number. How did people get there? I mean, it's a really strange statement. Again, if you would do this same statement with cars, you would be very surprised indeed. Let's make it even more strange. Here's the speed of light, yes? I stand still, I measure the speed of light, I measure to do the measurement, and I find 300,000 kilometers per second. Fine. I start changing the speed of light, and now measure how fast it's moving with respect to me, I still find 300,000 kilometers per second. Let's make it stranger still. Suppose I chase the speed of light myself with the speed of light. You would think that me and the speed of light, that ray of light, would, would, would go like this, right? And if we do our measurement, how, how much would the speed of light be compared to me? Zero. It, well, you would expect zero? Well, if who measures it? You yourself or someone looking at you? No. Speed of light. I am chasing the speed of light, myself going with the speed of light. Okay. And he has a measuring device. And I'm measuring okay, the you, speed of so, light as it so flies by. Yes. So how fast okay. would that speed of light go compared to me? Speed, speed of light? light? speed of light. <laughs> if this were cars, you would say zero, mm -hmm. right? Because you're doing the same. No. Even if you try, if you if you chase a speed of light, uh, uh, a ray of light with the speed of light, the thing will still go with the speed of light. That is really weird. So we're going to take it as our base assumption this week. Next week, we're going to do this differently. But this week, this is going to be our base assumption, speed of light invariant. How did people get there? Now, if you read the history books, you will find that it was done by a measurement. The people just measured the speed of light in different capacities. And that they found, it's called the Michelson-Morley experiment. I'm not going to explain exactly how the experiment was done, but people had ways to measure the speed of light and they did it uh, once uh, while traveling, well, chasing the speed of light and they did it once without chasing the speed of light and they found the same number. Okay. The history books will tell you that this is how it's done and this is actually not how it was done. Einstein already knew this result, this result, in a different way. He knew this from purely theoretical means. Now, let's take one step back a couple of decades before Einstein. In the 1800s, people found Maxwell's equations. If you don't know what they are, don't worry about it. It's a set of equations that tell you how electricity and magnetism make or have some uh, interaction with each other. I'm going to write them down just for completeness. You don't have to know anything about these, but just for the people who are interested, there are four equations. You don't have to know anything about this. If you want to know about this, please follow the course in magnetism or dynamics, or dynamics later this year. But there are four equations that tell you how electric fields behave and how magnetic fields, the Bs, behave, the Es and the Bs. And this one tells you how much electric field there is. This one tells you how much magnetic field there is. But if you look closely at this equation and this equation, then both these equations contain both. There's a little bit of electric, and there's a little bit of magnetic. And this one has a little bit of magnetic and a little bit of electric. So these later two equations tell you that electricity and magnetism are connected to each other. If you do something with an electric field, you will get some magnetism back. That's what this one says. This one says if you do something with a magnetic field, you get some electricity back. Right? This is the basis of all of our technology, by the way. Every electromotor works on this, these yeah. properties. So this is 1860s or so. But these equations have a very special and interesting property. If you take these equations, you can find that if you take a small amount of electric field, E, and you make it wobble a little bit, you make the electric field go up and down a little bit, then this equation tells you if you make it wobble, you get back a little bit of magnetic field, right? That's what this equation tells you. Even if you cannot read the mathematics, you can see that they're related. You make this one move, you get a little bit of ba back of that one. But now you have a magnetic field. You start with the electric field that you made wobble, you get a magnetic field back. But this equation tells you, but wait a minute, if you have a magnetic field, you get back a little bit of electric field. And Maxwell, the scientist, noticed that, wait a minute, that means if I start with an electric field and I make it wobble, then this equation tells you, oh, I get a little bit of magnetic field. 
So I start with a bit of electric, I get magnetic. But this equation tells you, no, but out of a magnetic, you get an electric back. <coughs> so you get the succession. Electric field, you make a wobble, you make a little bit of magnetic field. But this magnetic field makes a little bit electric field. This electric field makes a little bit of magnetic field. Back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. And Maxwell, the scientist, noticed this, and he thought that he said, wait, that means that nature allows wobbling of magnetic fields and electric fields to be created out of themselves, and that it moves through the universe, that it moves through space. And he could even calculate how fast that, that went. So we call this an electromagnetic wave. This wobbling of electric that goes to magnetic, goes back to electric, goes back to magnetic, back forth, back forth, and it moves through space. And Einstein, or uh, Maxwell, could even, using these formulas, calculate how fast that wobbling should move through space. And when he did that calculation, he found that the velocity with which, with which that moved was this particular number. Yes? He found that the wobbling back forth, back forth, moving through space, moves through space with this velocity. And this number is just some experimental number that appears here and there. And this number appears here. So those were numbers that were known from experiments. One number says something about electric fields. One number says something about magnetic fields. Maxwell found something can move with that velocity. This particular strange combination of magnetic, magnetic fieldness and electric fieldness, and when you plug in the numbers, these numbers were known, you get 300,000 kilometers per second. That was a huge discovery, because people by that time already knew something that went for 300,000 kilometers per second, namely light. Nobody knew what light was at that point. People only knew how it, how it behaved. If you put it through a lens, it breaks. Snell's law, all these sorts of things. Nobody knew what light was. And when Maxwell, working on what is electricity and what is magnetism, when he found his equation and he did this calculation, he found, wait a minute, something comes out that moves at the speed of light. Then maybe this thing is speed of light. Maybe this thing is light. Maybe light is the wobbling of magnetic fields, electric fields back and forth, and biology has just decided that we are able, as humans, to pick that up. He's right. Light is an electromagnetic wobbling back and forth, back and forth. Now, this was known, was a huge discovery. All of a sudden, light was discovered. People knew that light existed and what it did, but now people knew what light was. Huge discovery in physics. But here's the important thing. If you go from these equations to this equation, here's the key part. Doing this calculation from up till down, you do not have to say how fast you, the observer of the light, is moving. That is strange. In other pieces of physics, mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, for instance, if I'm going to calculate, you know, I'm going to throw my coffee all over you people, yes? If I'm going to calculate how fast each coffee drop is flying towards you, I first have to define a coordinate system, agreed? I first have to say, this is my x-axis, that's my y-axis, that's my z-axis, uh, here's my zero point, this is one meter, that's two meter, that's three meter. You can only do calculations in physics about moving things if you first have defined with respect to which coordinate system you do the measuring. It is so implicit that you probably have not really realized that when you do an exercise in mechanics, that's the very first thing that you do. Define a coordinate system. The reason that you don't probably don't do this explicitly is, is mostly because when you're given an exercise, you already have a corner system given in the exercise, right? Something is moving along the road. That means the road is the corner system. Now, if no such system is given, you first have to define it. But here's the same thing. This number comes out even if you have not defined your corner system. It has nothing to do with measurement. It's literally just going through the math. And then Maxwell thought, well, there's two options here. Either this result holds only for one particular coordinate system. We haven't defined it, but maybe in these equations, there was already implicitly defined that you can only use it with respect to one coordinate system, right? There's five million coordinate systems that you can define, right? Every one of you has a coordinate system attached to your belly button. Now, with respect to whom 
is this measured? Well, maybe these equations tell you, well, it really has to be Felix's belly button with respect to which, that this is really Maxwell's equations in the Felix system and not in anybody, anyone else's. That's option number one. In that way, you can sort of justify, oh, but that means that this speed has to be only true for Felix and other people have to find different numbers. That's option number one. Option number two is, maybe this number comes out regardless of which coordinate system. Maybe the speed of light is invariant. Maybe it doesn't matter who uses this. Now guess which one physicists took back in the day, 1860, 70, 80. The first one. They thought, well, it's ridiculous that everybody, that the speed should be the same for everybody, because obviously with cars, or <coughs> carriages, I guess, in those times, yes, with cars, this is not true, so why should it be true for light? So everybody thought, no, 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 no. There must be some implicit choice in corner systems. Somebody, when they wrote down the, or, or nature itself, when, when nature defined the Maxwell's equations, it took the Felix system to be the one system. It's just that we don't know that system yet. We didn't know about it, that there was really one preferred system. And Einstein, right, this was the option that people took. And then people did measurements and they found, no, 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 it really doesn't matter if you take the Felix system or some other person's system. It really comes out the same. And then Einstein was the person who said, you know what? Let's forget about these. That particular, that one specialized coordinate system in which this holds. Let's assume that it holds for all. And that is that statement. If you read the books, you will find that people found the invariance by measurements, which is not untrue, it was checked by measurements. But Einstein and Maxwell before him already knew about this result. The speed of light seems invariant in nature. Okay? Now, the question is, why is this true? That's a very deep question that we're not going to go into today. Let's accept it as a fact of either the measurements or the theoretical calculation here. So, this gives you a little bit of history. Let's apply it. In the uh, first half, I already told you that this immediately tells you that time cannot be the same for everybody. Right? You remember the argument. If you're going to look at something that is moving, and you're moving along with it, then that thing will have less distance traveled with respect to you. But if the speed must come out the same, then time must have adapted. So that means time cannot be the same number for everybody. Let's derive the difference between one person's time and the next person's time using this statement. And Einstein, in his paper where he first published this, was in 1905, Famous story that he was not employed as a physicist. He worked at a patent office. It was just a uh, person sitting at a desk typing things for other people. And in his free time, he said, "You know what? Let's 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 derive the new rules of space and time." And he found it, that these rules. And one example that he took in his paper that he published in 1905 is the following. And this is the example that you will find in most of the books, including this one. So this again, Raquel. This is why I want to show you this because you will recognize it from other books. He used something that's called in nice German, a Gedanken experiment, <laughs> which just means an experiment that you can do in your mind and take it to its logical conclusion. He said, okay, suppose that you have a train and the train is traveling along a track and the train itself is going with a velocity V. Oh, with respect to what is this V measured? To the ground. To the ground, to the track, yes? This is what I mean. You have to define your coordinate system first. But you're so used to taking the ground as your coordinate system that it, you almost forget doing it. But the, in relativity, you have to be clear about these things. So this V is the velocity of this train with respect to the track. So, here's the train. And then Einstein came up with this ingenious thought experiment, Gedanken experiment. He said, okay, suppose that you would have a light bulb. Right? They didn't have a laser in those times. You have a light bulb. And suppose that you would put a mirror on the ceiling of the cart. And now you're going to take a, a ray of light. I'm going to draw that in red. And you're going to let the ray of light go up from the bulb. There's other rays as well, but we're only focusing on the one that goes up. It bounces against the mirror and it goes down. Yes? Well, that takes a certain amount of seconds, agreed? It's a small amount of seconds because the speed of light is so high, unless you have a very high train car, of course. But you can calculate what that number is. 
Now we're going to calculate that number, the amount of time that it takes to go up and down for the light to leave the bulb, hit the mirror and go back. We're going to uh, calculate it for somebody on the train, looking at it. And we're going to calculate it as seen by somebody who's not on the train, but on the track, looking at the train go by. So we're going to calculate two amounts of seconds for each of these two observers, and we're going to relate them to each other. Now we need some names because that makes life easy to talk. <laughs> shall we call? We need some names. So how shall we call this person? Alitza. <laughs> Alitza, really? <laughs> you do you mind? Sure. Okay, fine. Then obviously this is Raquel. Hey. Okay. So let's first calculate how long it takes. I'm going to call this the round trip, the round trip of the light ray, how long it will take as measured by Alitza. And let's introduce some colors. What is your color to? Blue. Blue. Okay, so everything that I'm going to write in blue is going to be Alitza. I'm going to write delta t. Delta t means the difference in time, difference in two moments in time, the duration, how long it takes. Just as a small nomenclature thing, please do not write T if you mean delta T, yes? It's a different thing in physics, and you get, you're going to confuse yourself and me if you're going to confuse these two notations. T means what time it is now. Delta T is how long something takes, say, the, 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 on how long this lecture takes. That's the difference between two moments in time. What we're talking about is the difference in, mom in moments in time. Starting here, back forth, that amount of time, it's a delta T, not a T. Now suppose that this card has a height of some number L, so many meters. You tell me, how many seconds does it take for this light in the Alitza frame to go up and down? It's a high school physics exercise, this one. In fact, it's maybe your first class in physics exercise. You know how, how many meters it has to travel? And you know how fast it goes. Okay, how many seconds does it take? Okay, so distance over the, the velocity, yes? So what is the distance? How many meters does the light have to travel up and down? 2L. 2L, yeah. One time's up and down. How fast does the light go? Speed of light, okay? So C. I'm not going to use 300,000 kilometers per second, we're going to use C. C is the universal number for speed of light. It comes from some language, I always forget which one it is, but I think it means uh, velocity or high speed or something like that in some language. Any Greek people? Now, there we go. Do you know? It's 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 like Selenitas or something like that, or is it not, not Greek? Okay, well, we have to look it up, okay? Speed of light. Now, last year when I gave the course, some, somebody said, no, it's, it's language such and such, and it was something Aramaic or something like that. Okay. Yeah, All right. Celerity also is like sort of speed in English. Is it? Yeah, right. You have, uh, okay. And in French also. Oh, then really? Celerity mm -hmm. is like speed, like how. how no, okay, then we're going to make this a French thing, okay? It's a no, French invention. It's French. probably Latin. Or no, something. let's make it French. <laughs> it's, a, it's French. All right, now let's go to the. So this, num this, this is now fixed, yes? If you know how high the cart is and you know, how, you know the number for C, either from this or from measurement, there you go. You can calculate what the number is. We don't, we don't care about the numbers, we care about the formula right now. Now, this is in the Alitza frame. Let's go to the Raquel frame. Preferred color? Uh, whatever. Uh, red. Uh, red, sure. Sure. Yeah. You, you, you're wearing a red sweater, why not? So. <laughs> now, this is slightly more complicated now. Because look. Let's look at it from the Raquel frame, because the cart, at the moment that the light leaves the bulb, the cart is still here, agreed? But at the moment that the light hits the mirror, for her, the cart is now here-ish. But that means, as seen by her, the light did not go straightly up, it went with an angle. Do you see that? Let's actually draw that. So this is the moment that Raquel sees the light go up, it has just left the lamp. But because the thing is moving with respect to her, a couple of seconds later, so this is a couple of seconds later, the <coughs> light 
will have hit the mirror here, but that means as seen by her, the light did not go in a home. This is not a very nice drawing. The light did not go straight up as seen by her. It went in this direction, right? Now, and then it still has to bounce back, but let's start with this one first. How many seconds does this take? Just the, let's call this the up part. <coughs> as seen by her, how many seconds does it take for this ray of light to go from the bulb to the mirror? So. Well, whatever the distance is over the speed of light. Yeah, whatever the distance is, right? Divided by the speed of light. That's your high school physics again. I told you, you for relativity, you just need high school physics, mathematics. But what is that distance? Is it this distance? Is it that distance? That's Which one is it? Well, square root v squared plus c squared. That's uh, uh, v squared plus the uh, v squared times t. So the distance that it traveled plus the right. up distance that traveled. So that is correct. Pythagorean theorem. Let's on, now so. that's, that's, that's correct. Let's unpack it. The distance traveled by this ray of light as seen by Raquel is this, uh, 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 this one, right? But if you want to calculate that number, you can use Pythagorean theorem. Now you know how many meters the light has gone up for her, right? That's just the height of the car, that's L. We called that L before. So that's still L. How many meters is this? How many meters is there between the light coming from the bulb and the moment that the light ray has hit the mirror? So this distance. The actual uh, movement on the x-axis. That's correct, of course. It's the amount of meters that the train has traveled, right? Now, the amount of meters the train has traveled, here's your high school physics again, it's just the velocity of the train, that's v, this v, times, well, the amount of seconds that, that, the, that, that it was underway. That is actually the number that we don't know yet. That's this number, t up. Everybody agree with this? Mm -hmm. And now using Pythagoras theorem, we can calculate this side, the distance. The distance that the light has traveled as seen by Raquel. Now, Pythagoras theorem means take this guy squared, take all of this squared, and that gives you this distance squared, so you have to take a square root of that. So you get L squared plus V times delta T up squared squared. So that's this, just using high school physics. Now what we wanted to know was this number, but it, it, it appears in itself. Yeah. So you have to do a little bit of algebra to get it out. Do you want us to do this step? I'm happy to do so. Yes? If the distance is not still times by two, because it's um, if, if, if by the amount of time I mean the full round trip to go back to the lamp, then the answer is yes. But this is only for the light going up. At the moment that the light goes down, it's actually the same amount of time, so I'm just going to take my result times two. So, yeah, let's do the exercise. Sure, why not? Let's do some, some algebra here. I want to get this number out. It's on both sides. I propose you start with squaring. So what we're now doing is getting this number t up out. This, this, this guy squared gives you, you have to square the other side as well. You get L squared plus V squared delta t up squared. Right, you squared both sides. I see two delta t ups, so I can bring them all to one side. This is not physics, yeah? this is just doing algebra. And that means I get my delta t up squared equals L squared over C squared. I get this number, oh, excuse me. Not squared. Yeah, yeah. I'm also going to take the square out. So you get this, there you go. If you would ask Alitza, how long did it take you to see this light go up and down? She would say, oh, it's a 2L over C. If you're going to ask Raquel the same question, same array of light, same process, and you ask her, how long did it take you 
to see this happen, she would say, it's this number. I didn't multiply by two, yes. Yeah, we still have to multiply by two, yes. Um, just to be sure, this part is only for the light to go up. But do you see that when it goes down, it has to travel the same distance down again? So the amount of times is twice that number. So I'm going to remove the up part because the down part is really just the same number and just multiply by two. So I have two answers now. The Alitza answer and I have the Raquel answer in blue, respectively red. Do you see that those numbers are not the same? Yes? Wouldn't the fact that the card is further away uh, matter for the time it goes down? And no, because the amount of seconds that it has moved is the same as it was here. If the card goes with a the, with the constant velocity, yeah. then the going down part has the exact amount of distance. And that doesn't change out of uh, child's perspective? No, that's the same. If you I mean I'm skipping a step, yes, I'm skipping the step where the light goes down, feel free to do this yourself, but you will find the same number. So this is why I just multiplied it with two in one go. Now, here's the conclusion. Do you see that this number is not that number? So the amount of time as seen by one person is not the same amount of time as seen by the next person. In fact, we can even relate them to each other. And now I'm going to go back to black. Because if you look, where's my blue one? There you go. If you look, this part is just Alita's time, isn't it? This is just that. So if you were to combine these two with each other, well it's going to be a nice colorful picture this way, you're going to get delta t, Raquel sign, equals some strange combination of the speed of light and the speed of the cart, the train, times Alitza's time. Yeah, this is our conclusion. Alitza's time multiplied by some number gives you Raquel's time. Not the, so they don't measure the same amount of seconds. Yeah. Who's measuring more seconds? So we see that it's not the same number. Who is measuring more seconds? Raquel. Raquel is measuring, Raquel is red. Yes. More seconds? Yeah. Please convince yourself of this for a moment. Yes, you have to learn how to read the mathematics. But it's only if the lower number is smaller than one. Then That's true. Yeah. Mm. It will always well, one be thing I can tell you if... So then Alitza sees more seconds. Uh, no, you will see more. Sorry. Look, first of all, Sorry. let's start with the black part here, yes? This black part is one over square root. And... Um, if you put any v in, you would get a number that is definitely bigger than 1. Why? Well, at the moment you put a v in, then you have a fraction where the denominator of the fraction becomes smaller with v. Do you see this? If you make v bigger, you let the train go faster, faster, faster. Then you're subtracting more and more and more from this 1. So you get 1 over a number that is small, which itself makes it big. So this thing, let's make a plot of this. This thing is what we had on our big list at the beginning, the Lorentz factor, right? I told you there was this one function that will tell you how much seconds there difference there is, and we can make a plot of the Lorentz factor. Here's v, and here's the outcome of v over c squared. This thing, yes. This black thing is what you see on the y-axis. And here's the velocity of the train. Now, at the moment that the train has zero velocity, so that means the train is just standing still, then you get 1 over 1 minus 0, that's just 1. Then Alitza's time and Raquel's time are in agreement. No surprise there. If the train is not moving, they might as well just be on the same train, right? So, of course, they get the same number. But it's nice that the mathematics agrees. But at the moment that the train starts moving, then the denominator, is the same argument again, becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. So this fraction becomes bigger, bigger, bigger. So that means apparently at v, uh, when the train is not moving, you start with this thing having the number one. 
but it will rise at the moment that you give the train more and more velocity. When does it have the highest velocity? Or when it does it have the highest outcome? The black part. When we eat the speed of light. When we eat the speed of light, because look, then you get one over zero. And one over zero, if I'm not mistaken, is infinity. Yes, it's very big. <laughs> So at C, when the train would itself go with the speed of light, then you go all the way to infinity. Right? In mathematics, you call this an asymptote. If you would actually draw the picture, you will see that it's actually very close to 1. And only at the very end does it rise up very quickly all of a sudden. Yes? I, I tried to draw it that slightly goes up at the beginning, but the drawing, the, the, the increase is so slight, you would not see it. Yeah, I mean, it looks sort of wobbly now, <laughs> okay? That's my crappy drawing skills. It's almost straight, it rises very slowly, and only at the very end, like 90% or so, when you're 90% the speed of light, this is when all of a sudden it becomes big. Now, what that, what the, what that means is that in this whole region, this Lorentz factor is about one-ish. And if it is about one ish, then that means that Raquel's time and uh, Alitza's time are pretty much the same. An unmeasurably small difference. This is why you guys have never noticed this effect. I'm walking now. I'm the train. My time is different than yours. But because my speed is so ridiculously small compared to C, I'm here-ish. It's almost as if my amount of time is the same as yours. This is why the effect is so small. This is why you don't see this effect on everyday life. But the effect really is there, and it only becomes measurable or big at the moment that V is very close to C, or gets close to C, like 60% of the speed of light, 80%, 90% or so. Okay? Now, back to my original question. Who measures more seconds, given that you've seen this now? Is Alisa in blue or Raquel in red? Raquel. Mm -hmm. Because whatever number you take for Alitza, you have to multiply with at least one and probably more. So Raquel will measure more seconds to see this happen. Yes? So, now think about Raquel. Well, don't think about her. Think about <laughs> place yourself in her mind, okay? <coughs> place yourself in her mind. You can do this on Valentine's Day or so. But for now, just think about her mind. At the moment... Yeah, I'm going to, to take this out of the uh, recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the moment um, that you place yourself in Raquel's mind, and she's looking at the process, she's looking at how many seconds it takes for the light to go up and down. Let's say that Alitza, Alitza saw this happen in two seconds. Two seconds. It's, it's probably a lot less than two seconds because the speed of light being so big, but just for number's sake, let's make it two seconds. Okay. Raquel will measure, well, depending on how fast the train is going, but let's say that the train is going fast enough that the Lorentz factor becomes big enough that Raquel's number for the same process is five seconds. Okay. Now again, think about looking through her eyes, looking at Alitza and her train going that direction. How would it look for Raquel? If she sees everything on the train, or at least this process going with taking five seconds instead of two. Slow motion. Something that should have taken two seconds, now all of a sudden it takes five seconds. So for Raquel, looking from here to this process, seeing it take more seconds means apparently this the light or the, the process is going in slow motion. It takes more seconds to complete. Yeah? So apparently things you see things happen slower if you see them happening while they're moving away from you. That's what the result is here. Yeah? Now, here is where a misconception easily comes into mind. And I'm going to specify this because I really don't want to, you to fall into this trap. You might think at this point, what I'm going to say is wrong. You might think at this point, oh, obviously it's going to take more seconds as seen by, by uh, uh, Raquel, because in order for her to see what happens on the train, there has to be some light that goes from the train to her eye or to her measuring instrument, right? There's a correct statement. She will not see anything unless something, some information moves from the train to her. That is a correct statement. 
But while the train is moving, you might say, oh, but wait a minute, the train has now, is now more meters away from Raquel's eye, so whatever information she has to pick up to see the process happen is going to take more time to travel towards Raquel's eye. Yes? That is two. That too is a correct statement. You see what I'm talking about? If something is moving away from you, then every next thing happening there is going to take more seconds to get to your eye because that person or that thing is moving away from you. Yes? Mm -hmm. That is not this effect. It is absolutely true that if something is moving away from you, the information from that thing will take more seconds to reach your eye, but that is not the cause of this effect. Note that in this whole derivation, I've never specified how Raquel did the measurement. I've never said, well, and then also some light had to move to her eye, and that also took a couple of seconds. I never mentioned anything of that. So this effect has nothing to do with the travel time of information from the train to her. It's really a property of space and time itself. It's not a property of the measurement. It's not a property of the travel time of the information from her, from her to your eye. It really is space time itself. Now, this is an easy misconception. Sometimes when you ask people about relativity and you ask them, why is this true, this effect? We call this time dilation. Why is this true? Some people will say, oh, it's because it takes a little while for the, for the information to get to her eye. Wrong. It is true that that effect happens, but that's not the cause for this equation. Okay? Just to get that out of the way. So we have a very interesting result here. The amount of seconds for something is a bigger amount of seconds if you see it happening while it's moving away from you. By the way, the same effect also happens if the person is moving towards you. Same effect. By the way, remember the misconception that I just said? Oh, it has to do with the travel time? If that were the case, then that means if the train was moving towards Raquel, the effect would be opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Because then every next point in the process would take less time to reach her, and you would say that Raquel measures less seconds. That is not true. This effect happens regardless of which direction the train is moving. It really has nothing to do with the travel time of the information. It's an effect of time itself. All clear? But it is strange, right? Let's make things a little uh, more strange now. Because Raquel is now looking at Alitza. And Raquel sees the amount of seconds happening at Alitza to be a bigger number. She sees Alitza and her lamp and her, and her mirror and everything go in slow motion. But that means Alitza's life cycle itself will go in slow motion. So that means if she is standing over here, so here then Alitza drives by with a train cart, you will actually see Alitza age by a smaller number than you yourself. Because you say, uh, excuse me, Alitza will say one hour has passed. Mm -hmm. And you will say, no, 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 five hours has passed. Mm -hmm. You grow older than Alitza does. Mm -hmm. That's a strange effect because, well, let's, take, let's, let's move away from you two as examples. So let's take myself. I am 40 years old. And you guys are 20-ish or so, right? So if we were to make the situation such that um, I was on board here and I was moving away with respect to you, then my next birthday is going to take more seconds than your next birthday. That means in a certain amount of time, you will have had more birthdays than I have. In fact, that means that Maybe if we set up the experiment, I will have aged by two birthdays, while you have aged by 30 birthdays. That means by the time that the train is now stopped and we go stand next to each other again, you have turned from a 20-year-old person to a 50-year-old person, where I, is, I have turned from a 40-year-old person to a 42-year-old person. This is not a biolog biological effect. It's not hyperbole. It's not poetic. This is what nature does. The amount of seconds is not the same. I'm older than you now, but that's only because <laughs> um, I was nice enough not to travel with a high velocity with respect to you. Otherwise, you would have been older than me by now. And, and, and yes, and if you challenge me, I will still do that, okay? So by next week or so, you all guys will be 50, now we will be still 40. This effect is really, really true. So naturally, when Einstein published this, this time dilation effect, uh, people thought, wait a minute, that, that cannot be true. Something must be wrong here. Einstein even himself was a little bit 
scared when he published this result. So his article in which he put this, he put the word heuristic in the title. And heuristic means, well, I'm sort of making this up. Might very well be wrong. Don't take it too seriously. But now we know that nature really works like this. How are we on time? Speaking of time. You don't have a clock. So. Quarter to one. Quarter to one? So we have 15 minutes? Yeah. Good. Well, a bit less. More like 10 to one. Okay. No, quarter to one. 17 to one. To be okay. exact. <laughs> <laughs> we can also take this whole lecture room and make it move very fast. <laughs> Increase the amount of seconds, yes? Yes. But what if... Uh, I watch your kill and then the oh, 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 yes. There's always somebody asking this question. Yes, and that's a good. That's a that's a good thing. Because what if Raquel had her own little light bulb and mirror, and it was viewed by Alitza moving by? You could have done the same derivation, and Alitza would have said, "No, no, no, Raquel. It is you who's taking less seconds." And then you get in. You see this happening, yeah. You can just take this experiment, give it to, to Raquel. You get the same result with these two numbers reversed. So now you get in a strange situation that Raquel says that Alitza took more seconds and Alitza says that Raquel took more seconds. So who's right? Who's older? Sorry? Who's older? Who's older? That would be a different equivalent way of asking the same question. No, she's absolutely right. That's all right. Just take this experiment, give it to her. You get the reverse conclusion. And then both of them will claim about the other person that the other person is older. Now, as strange as it is that one person gets older by 30 years, whereas the other only by two, it's even stranger still if they can say that about each other. Yes? That's a good question. Do you know, do you know the answer? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone know the answer? Well, <coughs> well, they can only say to each other that they are older as long as they're moving relative to each other because they can't just stand next to each other. No, but at some point they stop. I think that hmm? when you when you have to you have you have to turn around and then you're accelerating and then you cannot use special relativity anymore. Yeah. Okay. And then you just cancel the same effect as here. Um no? I, I'm going to comment on that in a second, but you, you everybody sees the question. You might as well apply the, the, the situation you give the experiment from one person to the next you get the opposite conclusion and as strange as, as one conclusion is, having two conclusions that are opposite is even stranger. So naturally, people thought, no, that this theory is bogus. <coughs> Forget about this theory. Is it about reference frames? Because yes. like the speed mm -hmm. of the, it's <laughs> yes. about the ground. So ah, because if you have the light uh, at Raquel's place, then the reference frame would be the moving object that doesn't move. Uh, well, that moves for no, Raquel. Oh, be doesn't. careful now, be careful now. Right. It would yeah. be like the coordinate system would be on my body. Yeah, on, yes. the, on the... So, for the moment now, like the coordinate system doesn't move, it's with Raquel, because it's like the speed is taken uh, this from the Raquel. Yes. But if you take the observer Alitza, okay. then the reference frame would be in the train. No, that is a very good point. Let me go, let me go into that for a second. Okay. Yes. No, it's, it's, it's good. By the way, this is exactly this type of interaction that I think is useful to do relativity as. Yes. So, thank you. Um, so, here's a suggestion that if we indeed would take the experiment, give it to Raquel, then my argument was then you, get, you go through the same steps, you get the opposite conclusion. But maybe a resolution to this paradox is, oh, but wait a minute, this v was defined as the velocity of the cart with respect to uh, Raquel. Whereas if you would reverse the argument, then this v does not apply anymore. That is true. But you know what v would apply then? The Raquel moving in yes. the opposite direction. It's minus the same number, agreed? Mm -hmm. yeah. But minus the same, you're going to square away the minus here. You have a v here, but you square it. So even though you put a minus in there, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So it, it, it's a good guess, and you're right. The V, I mean, uh, me giving this experiment to her means that in the equations the V switches sign, but for the end result, you will get the same conclusion. If only this square had not been there, we could have done something with it. There would have been some difference. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Any more suggestions? It's a good question. How there we have a paradox here, something that doesn't agree with the other guy's uh, uh, conclusion. So it's it's okay. not in the V's. The V only well you can only compare the age if you would stop the trains now 
as mm-hmm. long as they're move uh, as as long as one of the trains are moving, that's fine. They can, like, they can both see the other person as older whilst, mm-hmm. right? But the moment you stop the time, you're not in inertial. Uh, stop the train, you're not in, in uh, not in an inertial system anymore. That is actually Hence, special relativity doesn't hold, so it's fine because. Okay, that is the correct answer. What he mentioned was, at the moment that you want to compare two people's ages you have to be sure that they either stand next to each other or at the very least be in the same coordinate system, right? But if you want to be in the same coordinate system and you start with not being in the same coordinate system, they were moving with respect to each other, and you want to make them in the same coordinate system, then either the train has to stop, has to slow down or the car has to start running along with the train in order to be in the same coordinate system. But that means now let's take you as an example that you had to run along with it to make sure that you're in the same corner system and that means for at least a while you had to go from zero velocity to v velocity that means you accelerate it for a while mm-hmm. and do you remember what we t- said at the beginning about the inertia frames about special relativity that it only applies in an inertia frame if Raquel starts to run special relativity doesn't hold anymore so what does that mean it means that if Raquel wants to speed up along with the train, her acceleration will make her in a non-inertial frame, and a non-inertial frame means that at least part of these rules do not apply to her anymore. So this base assumption that we had that both of these can have, could have used the same formula is simply not true. One of them was in an inertial frame, Alitza in this case. So she was correct in using this formula, but Raquel having to run along to do the age comparison makes herself in a non-inertial frame, and that means she does, is not allowed to use this formula. So our assumption that both people can use the same formula was wrong. They're not in the right frame. You see the importance of inertia frames again. It's really important that you know the difference. Now, yes, please. If, like, for example, in satellites, you have to compensate for the clock, right? Uh, yes. With this, like, uh, with these things, you measure the ta- you measure the age at the same time. That's why you have to compensate. Uh, yes, but now you're complicating matters a lot because okay. at the moment, no, no, it's fine. But I mean, it's 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 an honest question. Here's the honest answer. Um, the point is, if you in satellites, they also have different times than they have on Earth, uh, right? I mean, your your GPS doesn't work if they don't compensate for the difference in time over there uh, as it is here. But that's for two reasons. One of them is because the satellite is moving with respect to the person on Earth. That's this effect, and. As a separate effect, there's a difference in gravity. Mm. Further up in the air, you have less gravity, and that means gravity also affects time. That's not part of this course. So if you're not picking up this part, don't worry about it. But the difference in time is not just due to velocities, it's also due to gravity. So your situation where you say, what, how about the satellites? That, that's a general relativity effect. You have to mm. take gravity into account. Now, so what we saw here, based on Alitza's question, that you might as well reverse the argument, in special relativity, you very easily might have the impression that something is wrong. And usually nothing is wrong. It's just that you have to rethink whether you apply to formulas where they, where they were allowed. Now, if you recall before the uh, lecture, I gave a list of what we're going to do. And in week three, I had this bullet point that says paradoxes. Those are these things. Mm. That sometimes you feel, wait a minute, something is off. But by the time we have the full apparatus of special relativity, right? we only have the time dilation now, we get the bigger transformations later, the Lorentz transformations. We're going to learn in week three how to apply them such that you will see that no paradoxes exist at all. Okay? So if you find a paradox, don't worry too much at this point. In week three, we're going to learn how to resolve them. Special relativity, as, as to the best of our knowledge, has none of these paradoxes if you know how to apply it well. And here's a, here's a good example. First question that you have to ask yourself, are you allowed to apply the rules in the first place? In this case, that was the resolution. Yes? Is that why it's called the Lorentz factor? Because that was solved only by somebody else? <laughs> oh, no, yeah, <laughs> no, there's a, yeah. <laughs> the paradox was like... There's a bit of history involved. Okay, okay. Why it's called Lorentz transform. In fact, a lot of things are called after Lawrence. <coughs> uh, Lawrence Hendrik Anton Lawrence was a Dutch physicist. He won the Nobel Prize in 1902. Not for this, by the way, but for the Zeeman effect. Yet another guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. He was a very smart guy. He did a lot of things. Um, no, it's called the Lawrence factor. Here's a piece of history again. Remember that I said 
if you take these Maxwell's equations, that one option was that no, the speed of light is not invariant. But instead, there's just some preferred coordinate system with respect to which you have to apply these rules. Okay? Lawrence was of that school. He thought, no, the rules only apply in one particular coordinate system. I called it the Felix system before. Um, but he did have this issue that the speed of light came out the same for everybody. So Lawrence thought, the scientist, he thought, you know what? Maybe light, or this conclusion that it is this number that comes out, um, maybe we can remedy this by saying that matter itself has a certain amount of stretchiness. There's some elasticity in matter, and that if you send light through it, it will shrink by a small amount or expand by a big amount. Not space itself, but just matter. And then he derived what the formula was for that. How much expansion do you need to make sure that everybody finds the same number for this? And then he found these equations, and they're called the Lorentz equations. So even though the equations are correct, the physics is wrong. He said it's matter itself that does something. So there's, there, is a, there's, there, there is a preferred corner system, and in order to make sure everybody finds the same number for the speed of light, matter itself has to stretch and expand. And Einstein said, no, 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 no. It's space that does it, not matter, it's space. And then Einstein did his derivations, and he found the same equations, and then they're still called Lorentz transforms. So it's the right equation based on the wrong conclusion. That's why it's called Lorentz transform. Now, um, what we're going to do um, in the tutorial in a moment, I'm going to ask you, this is the time dilation, I'm going to ask you to derive the, uh, this doesn't quite work anymore, let's do it in blue. It's not Alitza base, it's just blue because my other doesn't work anymore. What we have now seen in this particular example is that time, the amount of time can become bigger and smaller depending on how fast people are moving with respect to each other. But for space, the same holds. So let me write down the conclusion and I'm going to ask you to come up with your own example in which you can derive this yourself. It's a nice PBL exercise. But I'm going to give you the conclusion. Suppose that there's a stick flying by, yes? And I'm happy, I happen to be sitting on this stick. Don't ask me how I do this, but I sit on a stick while it's flying by <laughs> without crashing, okay? With constant velocity, so it's kind of a hypothetical situation. But suppose it happens. I'm sitting on a stick and I fly by, and I'm going to measure how long the stick is, yes? And you are also going to measure how long this stick is on which I am sitting. Now, if the stick is, say, two meters long, you would expect, well, lengths of sticks have nothing to do with how fast the thing is moving, yes? Just like time doesn't care about how fast things are moving. Now, if you would do that calculation, you will find that your measured number of how long the stick is is not two meters, it's a different number. You will find that the stick, as seen by you, is not two meters, as it is by me, it's going to be a smaller number. So, you will find this formula. So, let me make uh, this. That's me sitting on a stick. And that's you. You will find a different number. Just to give things some names, this guy, remember this Lorentz factor. The whole thing, including the one over, is what we call Gamma. Gamma, the Lorentz factor, is by definition this number. So you can write this equation that we had for the time dilation as follows. The time dilation is delta t equals gamma times the other person's delta t. Yeah? Here, we have a similar relation, but now for distances, but now the gamma becomes 1 over gamma. I haven't derived this. This is going to be your exercise. Can you think of an example, something along these lines that will get that equation out? Can you just derive it with v equals x over t, or distance over time? 
you just yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to invite you to bring it to the PBL. That's one of the ways to derive this. But without like a thought experiment? Uh, you need a thought experiment. All right. Yes. Well, what was the question again? It's a nice I will. I will. Spaced out, sorry. No, here was somebody spaced out. There's a joke in there somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> now, uh, people, so in the tutorial, what I would like to do with you guys is let you derive this yourself by using an argument like this. And there's a separate exercise, namely, question. You have a couple of minutes left still, right? Mm, like minus three. Mm. <laughs> How come we, we started with 10 and all of a sudden we minus three? There's no relativity effect, is there? <laughs> I must have slowed down, I guess. Okay, then I will, break, then I will bring my questions to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the tutorial. But by the end of the tutorial, we have both these equations, this one and that one. So I will see you guys uh, there, half of you. So that's it, I guess, right? See you in... Um, Half an hour minus three minutes. I uh, am in the other tutorial group now. So. Well, you. I will see you. Yeah.